what is up you guys so in this one we're going to see how to properly sample analog signals and a very important criterion to keep in mind when sampling signals that is what happens to frequencies when going from continuous time to discrete time are all the frequencies seen the same way could i distinguish between any frequency i want all these questions we'll try to answer or we will answer in this lecture so without further ado let's get started okay so let's sample analog signals of course there's many and many ways to sample analog signals in this course we're going to just limit ourselves to uniform sampling that is sampling on regular intervals of course of course there's many other types of sampling right like non-uniform sampling or compressed sampling and so forth which is very interesting and the idea behind non-uniform sampling is that when you have a constant type of signal you have a signal that you know that is constant for a long period of time then changes abruptly and then again constant well over the constant period you don't need a lot of samples to represent the signal actually you only need one sample right so over here your sampling period would be low and then right here where there's a lot of stuff going on you need a higher sampling rate right and then back here where it's constant you only need one sample right so that's the idea behind non-uniform sampling so uniform sampling is a type of sampling that takes in or picks samples at regular intervals of time from an analog signal that is at time instances that are equal to n t where n is an integer value right so say i've got this analog signal right here right this is t and this is x a t right well picking samples over here let's say t is right here then this sample corresponds to n equal one over here is n equals zero right here is at 2t and so on right so t again is referred to as the period or is also referred to as sampling interval because it's the interval where samples occur at the edges now the reciprocal of t denoted by fs is the sampling frequency right and this is measured in samples per second so tells you how many samples you're collecting per second or you can use the term hertz right so what's going on here if you would put a block diagram to explain what's going on so I've got this sampler, right, that opens and closes, loosely speaking, at regular intervals of t, right? That's producing a sampling rate of fs, right? Where the input of this sampler is the analog signal x a of t, and the output is the discrete time signal x of n, right? So we've got a time frequency relationship going on and why is that it's because what i'm doing is at time t equal to n t right or in terms of frequency n over fs i take my samples right and inherently there is a relation between t and n now, of course, those two variables are related linearly by t, but it is thanks to those two variables that there exists a relationship between my frequency in continuous time and frequency in discrete time. Now, to establish this relationship, let's say we've got a cosine signal in analog domain. That is, say I've got my x a of t, right? That is a cosine 2 pi f t plus a phase theta, right? A simple sinusoidal signal. 
Now, once the signal is sampled at instances of n, so at the output of the sampler, I have picked samples corresponding to time t equal n uppercase t, right? That is a cosine. So instead of my lowercase t, I've got 2 pi, I've got n t, right? Now, in terms of frequency, instead of my uppercase t, I'll put 1 over fs, that is the sampling frequency, and hence we get that my xn is simply 2 pi f over fs times n plus theta. So now this means that the frequency in discrete time is all this guy over here, right? So this is my lowercase f, frequency of the discrete time sinusoid, right? And it is f over fs. So that said, frequency in continuous time and my frequency in discrete time are related linearly by 1 over fs, right? This could also be written as f equal tf, in case you want to represent the linear relation in terms of the sampling period. And hence, in case you want to also show a relationship in terms of angular frequency, that is, we multiply by 2 pi on both sides, we get a lowercase omega, that is the angular frequency in discrete time, multiplied by uppercase omega, that is my 2 pi uppercase f, multiplied by t, right? Now, sometimes we refer to the discrete time frequency, lowercase f, as the relative normalized frequency, because it's normalized to the sampling rate, right? In previous lectures, we said that continuous time sinusoidal signals have frequencies that vary between minus infinity and plus infinity, right? We didn't write that down, but we definitely mentioned that, right? However, discrete time sinusoids have frequencies that are bounded between minus half and half. That's due to the omega that is limited between minus pi and pi, and everything on the exterior outside this band is just a replica and hence no information. So keeping that in mind, in continuous time, my frequencies are between minus infinity and plus infinity and in discrete time, they're bounded. Angular is bounded between minus pi and pi and the relative frequency f is bounded between minus half and half. So there's something weird going on here because, wait, you tell me that my uppercase f is between minus infinity and infinity, okay. However, if I come and replace it over here, right, if I, because my lowercase f is bounded and is linearly related to f using this formula, so if my f is bounded between minus half and half, right, using this formula over here, I have a f over fs, which is also bounded between minus half and half, because f is equal to f over fs. Now multiplying by fs on both sides, we get that my continuous time frequency is also bounded between minus fs over 2 and fs over 2. So from this relationship over here, and in terms of angular frequency, can easily show the same thing. That is my omega, that is 2 pi f, so you can multiply by 2 pi on both sides. That would give you that your omega is actually between minus pi fs and pi fs, right? So what's going on over here? We can observe that the fundamental difference between continuous time and discrete time signals is in the range of values of the frequency variables f or omegas, right? So, but wait, my physical quantity uppercase f could be anything, right? I can, I can basically generate any analog signal at, in theory, at any frequency, right? But how come you came and told me here it's bounded between minus fs over 2 and fs over 2? What is going on? Okay, that is because you're sampling your signal. And hence, once you take a look at the sampled version whose relative frequency is bounded, then so is your uppercase f, that is the original frequency. So it tells you that periodic sampling, this means that periodic sampling of a continuous time analog signal is nothing other than a mapping 
of the infinite frequency range of the variable f, uppercase f, into a finite frequency range for the variable lowercase f. So since in discrete time we only have access or the frequency is just limited between minus half and half and everything else is a replica, that means that with a sampling rate fs, the highest value of uppercase f is nothing other than fs over 2. So my f max, due to this frequency mapping, due to the compression of my real axis, of my frequency axis, my infinity is now the half, and hence my f max is now the fs over 2, right? And likewise, my omega max is pi fs. So the point here is to keep in mind that sampling will introduce ambiguity. Since the highest frequency in a continuous time signal can be uniquely distinguished when such a signal is sampled at rate fs over 2 is my f max, right? Now to see what happens to frequencies above fs over 2, right? Let's say I, ha I generated a sinusoid that has an f that is greater than fs over 2. I'm going to show you what happens through the following example. Okay, so say I've got two sinusoids, right? The first one, x1, ft, is cosine 2 pi 10 t. So the frequency is 10 hertz. And the second one, x2 of t, that is also cosine 2 pi, but this time 50 t, right? Say we've got a sampling frequency of 40 hertz, right? That corresponds to a sampling period of 1 over 40 seconds, right? Okay, so let's go to MATLAB just to see how both plots would look like if I choose a time axis that is sampled at every t seconds, uppercase t seconds, where I'm going to get an error right now asking me what is t. Well, my t is 1 over 40. Then I go ahead. That's my time axis, right? discretized every 1 over 40 seconds, okay? Let's generate x1 at this sampling frequency and x2 at the same sampling frequency but at 50 hertz instead of 10 hertz. And let's go ahead and plot a stem axis of x1, right? This is my x1. And on the same plot, I'll plot x2. And guess what? It coincides on x1. That said, in discrete time, both signals are the same. So in discrete time, if I choose my sampling rate to be 40 hertz, 10 hertz and 50 hertz are the same. So we cannot distinguish between both aliases or frequencies. And even more, if you extend this, let's say I go up to, even if I generate a third sinusoid that is at 90 hertz, okay, 90 hertz, and I stem, I also get the same sinusoid. So 10, 50, and 90 are the same. Well, let's go down to 80, for example, see what happens. We get a constant signal. This corresponds to multiples of 2 pi in discrete time. Anyways, the point here is that 10 and 50 are the same. And this takes us back to what we were saying over here. So since my fs over 2 is the maximum frequency that I could resolve in discrete time, so let's go ahead and plot over here what's going on. So my minus fs over 2 and fs over 2 are my infinities, right? My minus infinity and plus infinity respectively. So since my fs is 40, then my fs over 2 is 20. So I've got minus 20 till 20 over here. And my frequency is at 10 hertz. So it's over here, right? This is where my signal lives at 10 hertz. So what's going on outside this band? So if I add my fs over here, so again, 60 would be my fs over 2 plus fs, right? This is fs over 2 plus fs. And fs over 2 
So my zero is my FS in this band. So this guy is minus fs over 2 plus fs the 20 so at 60 minus 10 right at 60 minus 10 that is 50 i have a replica an alias of the same signal and this is why both signals are seen as the same in discrete time when sampling at 40 hertz of course choosing a larger sampling frequency let's say I sample at 400 instead of 40 I can begin to see way more that is my 10 50 and 9 was it 90 yes are all within the band so they're all distinguishable we can distinguish between all three frequencies so let's go ahead and generate my time axis again okay my x1 at 400 instead of 40 my x2 at 400 instead of 40 and my x3 at 400 instead of 40. So let me close this figure, open another figure, and let's stem. So this is my x1 at 400 megahertz. This is my x2 at 400 megahertz, and this is my x3. As you can see, all of them are distinguishable, right? Got the blue, the yellow, and the red. Okay, good. So that's about it in this lecture. We talked about sampling of analog signals. We explained how to go from continuous to discrete time and what is the most important thing to keep in mind is that your maximum frequency if you're sampling at fs is fs over 2 an absolute value that is your band that where you can see the frequencies where you can distinguish between one frequency and another is minus fs over 2 up till fs over 2 and everything else is just a mere replica we gave an example on that showing that two sinusoids at 10 and 50 hertz are indistinguishable given that the sampling rate is 40 hertz because you can see between minus 20 and 20 and so 10 lies within this band okay but 50 is its mere replica when looking at the adjacent band 20 till 60 okay thanks for watching if you found this lecture beneficial please leave a like on the video subscribe to the channel if you have any questions whatsoever leave your question down in the comment section below i'll make sure i'll get to your question as soon as possible also consider donating to my patreon account any amount you wish thanks for watching and i'll see you in future lectures